This is the eighth video in our series on Lie algebras. And today we're gonna to look at something called the Lie's theorem. So let's look at the statement. So let's let V be an n-dimensional complex vector space. So in other words, V can be just thought of as Cn. Then next, let's say that L is a subalgebra of GLV and it's a solvable Lie algebra. So look at some previous videos to recall what solvable means if you need to. Okay, then the result is that there exists a basis of V, which we'll call B, such that if you express X in this basis, you get an upper triangular matrix for all X in L. So the important thing here is that every element of this solvable Lie algebra is simultaneously upper triangularizable, if you will. Okay, so in the previous video, we looked at something called Engel's theorem, and I'd like to do a little compare and contrast with Engel's theorem and Lie's theorem because they're quite similar. So Engel's theorem has a very similar setup with the following differences. And so V, instead of being n-dimensional and complex, it's just finite dimensional, so that could be n-dimensional, and it's over any field, so instead of just complex numbers. So in fact, we can loosen this statement for Lie's theorem, but what we do need is a field of characteristic zero that's algebraically closed. So, well, that doesn't really give us many interesting choices other than the complex numbers. Okay, and then also, instead of looking at solvable Lie algebras, Engel's theorem considered nilpotent Lie algebras, and then the result was that every element of that Lie algebra was simultaneously strictly upper triangularizable. Okay, so this gives us a really nice intuitive way to think about nilpotent versus solvable Lie algebras. And that's in terms of some matrix Lie algebras, which are maybe familiar examples and like easy to work with. And so you want to think about nilpotent Lie algebras as being some sort of abstraction of the Lie algebras of strictly upper triangular matrices. Whereas solvable Lie algebras are like the abstraction of just upper triangular matrices. So strictly upper triangular means that the diagonal has all zeros, but upper triangular, the diagonal is allowed to have non-zero entries. Okay, so let's uh, look at the first of a couple of lemmas that we will prove for this result over here, you know, as preparation, if you will. Okay, so let's suppose that we've got an n-dimensional complex vector space V, and then we've got just a single linear transformation X um, from V to V. So in other words, we've got a single element of GLV. So this would be like a single element of L, which is also in GLV. Then there is a basis B of V such that X is represented by an upper triangular matrix. So this is a purely linear algebra result. This says that any linear transformation can be written as an upper triangular matrix. This is much, much, much stronger because it uses the structure of the Lie algebra and the solvability to make all of them upper triangular at the same time. Okay, so I think that's enough about like highlighting how important this is. And now let's get into the proof of this. Okay, so first we're gonna show that X has an eigenvector. And well, this may seem totally trivial, but if we were not over complex numbers, if we were over real numbers, then it's really easy to find two by two matrices with no eigenvectors, the so-called rotation matrices. Or if we were over an infinite dimensional vector space, well, it's also really easy to find a linear transformation that is not, that doesn't have an eigenvector as well. Like for example, you take multiplication by X in the vector space of polynomials or something like that. Okay. So let's, let's get to this. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll take any 
non-zero vector, which I'll call v within v. And then after that, we're going to consider the following list of vectors or maybe set of vectors. And that'll be v and then xv and then x squared v all the way up to x to the n times v, where like x to the n is just the n-fold composition of x applied to v, if you will. Okay, so now what's important about this list of vectors or this set of vectors? We'll notice that there are n plus one total vectors here. And well, these vectors form a subset of V, which is n dimensional. So if we've got a set of vectors which has more elements than the dimension we're in, that means that this set is linearly dependent. So that's a result from like a linear algebra class. Okay, so we might like go straight to writing down a linear dependence relation from this set right here, but that's not what we're gonna do. What we'll do is chop vectors off the top one at a time as long as we still keep a linearly dependent set. So we wanna find like kind of the minimum linearly dependent set. And here's how we're going to do this. So let's take m, and I guess m is going to be between 1 and n, to be minimum such that the set v, x, v up to x to the m, v is linearly dependent. So perhaps that requires all of these vectors right here, but perhaps it requires less. So, okay, that's good. Now what we'll do is take our linear dependence relation on this set. So that means we can find these numbers, I'll call them alpha naught, alpha one, all the way up to alpha m. They're complex numbers because we're working over a complex vector space, such that alpha naught times v plus alpha one times x times v, and then plus dot 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 um, alpha m times x to the m evaluated at v, I should have been saying, is equal to zero. So that's our linear dependence relation. Okay, and now what I'd like to note real quick, and this comes from the minimality of m, is that alpha sub m is non-zero. Because notice if alpha m was equal to zero in this linear dependence relation, then, well, that means that we could have just find a smaller set, but then that would have like contradicted the minimality of m for what it's worth. So next up what we're going to do is factor this linear dependence relation. And we're gonna factor it into linear factors. And that's allowable because we're over complex numbers. And we know something about factoring polynomials over complex numbers. They all factor into linear factors. That's the so-called fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Okay, so factoring this, we'll have an alpha m out front. And then after that, we'll have x minus lambda naught times the identity matrix or maybe the identity linear transformation, if you will. I'll just write capital I for that. And then the next thing will be x minus lambda one times I, all the way up to x minus lambda some m times I. And then that's all evaluated at V to give us zero. So if you need like a little step in the middle, uh, feel free to use it where we take this equation right here and write it as alpha naught times the identity plus alpha one times the operator x all the way up to alpha m times the operator x to the m all evaluated at v equals zero. And then we're factoring that. And we could move through just like a normal polynomial ring if you want to, but I don't think we really need to do that. Okay, so next up, let's take k to be the minimum such that we have the following, you know, action, if you will. 
And that is, well, the tail here um, is non-zero. So let's talk about what that really means. And I'm gonna like assign that the letter or maybe the vector name W. Okay, so this is gonna be X minus lambda K plus one um, times the identity multiplied all the way up to X minus lambda M identity V it's non-zero. Now, maybe perhaps this K is M, which means this is like really an empty product and we just get the vector V, but perhaps it's not M. Okay, so the idea here is we're smashing all of maybe the terms from here to the end, where maybe this is the K plus first space, into a single non-zero vector. And so note that well, we can just make the choice. This object, this x minus lambda m times the identity acting on v, well, that's either zero or it's not zero. Um, if it is zero, then we found an eigenvector eigenvalue relationship. If it's not zero, then you keep going. So that's kind of the idea here. Okay, so now let's observe the following. We have x minus lambda k on the identity acting on w is equal to zero. And we know that because of the minimality of k. So the minimality of k means that if you go one further, you have to get zero. But notice that this can pretty easily be rewritten as x evaluated at w is equal to lambda k times w. But that's exactly what it takes for w to be an eigenvector of x with eigenvalue lambda k. And then let's maybe like rename this lambda k just to be equal to lambda as we move forward, maybe as needed. We don't need those indexes anymore. Okay, so now let's go on from here. Okay, now we're ready to move on by induction on the dimension of v, which we've called n. And so the base case here is the case when we have a one-dimensional vector space. But in a one-dimensional vector space, every you know, linear operator is simply just multiplying by a number. But multiplying by a number is, well, that's a diagonal operation. There's nothing off the diagonal, in fact, which means there's really no notion of not upper triangular, if you will. Okay, so in that case, we're done. Now let's make the induction step, starting with the induction hypothesis. So let's suppose that this statement holds for all vector spaces of dimension k, and that the dimension of v is k plus one. So in other words, v is isomorphic to c k plus one. Okay, now from there what we wanna do is let um, w inside of v be an eigenvector of x with value lambda. Well, this is essentially the setup we built on the last board. So in other words, uh, let's see, x applied to w is equal to lambda applied to w. Okay, great. And then next up, you know, we don't really need to draw a diagram, but I think it's useful just to like get those maybe drawing portions of our brain activated. So let's consider the following commutative diagram. So on the top, we'll have V, which is being mapped to V via our linear transformation X. And then we'll have the projection map, which I'll call pi. And that's going down to the quotient vector space where we're quotienting V by the one dimensional vector space spanned by W. I'll just write that as CW, but that's just the span of the single vector W if you'd rather write, write it like that. And then, well, we've got the same thing happening over here. So this is going down by the projection map pi V mod CW. And then we can complete this diagram with a map which I'll call X bar, which is also a linear transformation and it has the following action. So X bar acts on V plus CW to give us X V plus CW. So, I mean, I need like everything to happen on a coset down there because I'm in the quotient vector space. 
Okay, so let's maybe put this off to the side. This is just our maybe universe at this moment. Okay, now let's maybe make the following obvious observation, and that is the dimension of V mod CW is equal to K plus one minus one, which is K. Because it's the dimension of the parent vector space minus the dimension of the subspace that we're quotienting by. And so that's how we get that. Okay, so now what we'll do is apply the induction hypothesis to, well, this quotient vector space. So I'll just put this kind of arrow here. We're applying it to that quotient vector space. And so that's gonna build a basis where, you know, as things are upper triangular, well, one thing is upper triangular, x bar. Okay, so let's call that basis b bar. And maybe I'll write it like this. It'll be V1 plus CW plus, uh, all the way up to VK plus CW. So it's a little awkward, but we really do need cosets there. So that's why we've written it like this. And now from here, we want to lift this basis to a basis of the entire uh, vector space. So let's set B equal to W and then V1 and then V2 all the way up to VK. Okay, nice. And then, well, let's notice that if we take X and act on one of these basis vectors, well, what are we going to get? We're going to get something beta naught times W plus beta one times, let's see, V1 all the way up to what I'll call beta J times VJ. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because X bar necessarily acts on VJ plus CW in an upper triangular way. In other words, it gives us beta one V one all the way up to beta J V J plus C W. And then the only difference between these two, well, this one's in the quotient space, but since we're only quotienting by maybe a single vector or one dimensional subspace, that's where we get this extra bit right here. But this kind of equation right here is exactly what we need for this to be visually upper triangular. If you just think about the matrix listed like in the order where the basis vector W comes first and then V1 all the way up to VK. Okay, so there we've got it. We proved this lemma and we're ready to move on. Okay, so our next lemma will use the structure of Lie algebras. So let's suppose we've got an n-dimensional complex vector space and we've got L, which is a solvable Lie subalgebra of GLV. Then the result is that there's a vector V inside of V that's an eigenvector for every element X of L. So this is not something that you would expect to ever happen, you know, by accident. This solvability gives us this result. Okay. So let's see how we'll do this. Well, it'll be by induction on the dimension of L, not the dimension of the vector space, the dimension of the Lie algebra. And so if the dimension of the Lie algebra is one, well, there's not really anything to do. I'll let you write down the details if you need to. So now let's do the induction step. So let's suppose this statement holds for all Lie algebras of dimension K and that L has dimension K plus one. Okay, now let's go from here. So let's use the solvability of L. So L is solvable means L upper n with parentheses, if you will, is simply the zero vector space. Um, and this is gonna be for some natural number n. And well, since solvability was a couple of videos ago, let's recall what this notation is. Let's recall that L upper one in parentheses was the bracket of L with itself. In other words, the commutator subalgebra, uh, or in other words, L prime was another notation. 
And then L upper N plus one was the bracket of L upper N with itself. Okay, so that gives us an inductive way of building all of these things. Okay, great. And so, but notice that the solvability implies something like, that's pretty interesting. And that is that L prime is a proper subalgebra of L. And why is that? Well, otherwise we would have L upper N is equal to L for all N. That's because we keep applying this like commutator functor, if you will, and you never get anywhere. But that would mean that since we got to zero at some point that we started at zero. But that means that we would have a dimension zero thing and not dimension K, which I guess I should say we're assuming is bigger than or equal to one. Okay, great. So now what we'll do is take a subspace, I'll call it A, and it's not a full subspace, so in other words, it's not the whole um, algebra of L, such that two conditions are satisfied. And let's write those two conditions down. So first, that L prime, in other words, the commutator subalgebra, or the derived subalgebra is contained inside of A, and that L is equal to A direct sum with something that I'll call CZ. So in other words, the dimension of A is, well, one less than the dimension of L. So in other words, the dimension of A is K. So let's write that down here. So I can just simply write dimension of A is equal to K, but it's a subspace. I can find subspaces of all sorts of dimensions if I want to. So how would this happen in practice? Well, you would start with L prime, which you know is strictly less than L, and you would just add one vector at a time to that until you had, well, K linearly independent vectors in there, not worrying at all about it being a subalgebra. All it has to be is a vector subspace. Okay, so that being said, we're gonna make the following claim, and that is that this is indeed not just a vector subspace. This is an ideal. So A is an ideal of L. So that means not only is it a subalgebra, but it's a special subalgebra that has that absorption property. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, actually the proof is pretty quick. So let's notice if we take an X inside of L and an A inside of A, then we know that the bracket of X with A is inside, well, it's inside the bracket of L with L actually, but that is equal to L prime, which we chose A so that A contained L prime. But that's exactly the condition that we need in order to be an ideal. So now where are we gonna go from here? Well, let's notice that we've got a couple of things which are pretty obvious. That the dimension of A is equal to K, and we know that A is also solvable. And how do we know that? Well, put very simply, it is an ideal of a solvable Lie algebra, or really just a subalgebra of a solvable Lie algebra. Remember, we're assuming that L is solvable. So that means that A is solvable. So that means that we can apply the induction hypothesis. So let's do that. Applying the induction hypothesis, we know that there exists something that I'll call W inside of V such that we have W is an eigenvector for all elements of A. And then let's maybe let lambda be uh, the dual to A, or sorry, in the dual space of A. In other words, it's a linear transformation from A to C, B, the corresponding weight. So if you recall a couple of videos, we talked about weights and weight spaces and stuff like that. And well, this is that corresponding weight. So in other words, what we have here is if we attack A with W, 
It's the same thing as evaluating A at lambda and then multiplying to W. Okay, great. So now let's go on from there. Okay, so we've got this k-dimensional ideal of L, and thus it's a solvable Lie algebra itself, and applying the induction hypothesis, we got this vector W inside of V, that's an eigenvector for all A in A, and also we had this weight. And next up, let's consider the weight space of that weight lambda. And let's recall that we wrote that as V sub lambda. So that's gonna be all V inside of V, such that if you apply A to V, remember A is a linear transformation because everything's happening within this GLV, you get the same thing as applying lambda to A first and then to V. And this is gonna be for all A and A. So that's the definition of the weight space. Well, kind of almost. If this is a non-zero vector space, then it's a weight space and we had a weight to begin with. But we know this is a non-zero vector space because we know W, which is a non-zero vector, I probably didn't highlight that enough, is inside of V lambda, which tells us, you know, like I just said, that V lambda is a non-zero vector space, so it's non-trivial. Okay, so next up we wanna apply the invariance lemma, which we did a couple of videos ago. Okay, so the invariance lemma applied to V lambda, which, you know, we can view as a subspace of V, says that V lambda is invariant under the action of the entire Lie algebra. So recall that the invariance lemma said that weight spaces are invariant under, you know, action of the entire Lie algebra. Okay, so that is written as is L invariant. And then, well, let's write what that really means as well. So that really means for all x in L, if you take x applied to v, that's gonna be inside of v lambda for all v inside of v lambda. So if you wanna make a little picture of it, it would maybe be something like this. So if you were to apply any x to anything inside of v lambda, you land back in v lambda. So that is this like kind of looping action where you're applying that x. Okay, so now in particular, let's view z as a linear transformation from v lambda to v lambda. And so what was z? Remember, Z completed A into all of L. So maybe uh, let's insert that right here. Although, you know, we wrote that down before. Let's recall that L was equal to A plus CZ. It was like the missing vector to build the entire Lie algebra. And what we're really doing here is knowing that Z is inside of L, but we're making the restriction to this subspace. So in other words, it's something like this. We've got Z uh, restricted to V lambda is inside of GL V lambda, if you will. <clears throat> now notice if we didn't have invariance, then there's no guarantee that everything inside of V lambda would land back inside of V lambda. So we really did use the invariance lemma here. Okay, and now from here what we're gonna do is apply lemma one, or maybe the first lemma, to this z. Okay, so what that gives us is there exists something that I'll call v inside of v lambda, such that, well, v is an eigenvector of z. So in other words, z applied to v is the same thing as mu applied to v, where, well, mu is the eigenvalue. So in other words, mu is just a complex number, right? Okay, nice. And now we're ready for the claim, which essentially is gonna finish this whole thing off. And that claim is that this v, well, is the v that we want. This is the v that we're looking for. And so that'll go like this. So V is an eigenvector for all X inside of L. So in other words, it's simultaneously an eigenvector for everything inside of the Lie algebra.
And along the way, we definitely used solvability here, and that was one of the most important things that we had to do. Okay, great. So notice that if x is inside of L, that means that x is equal to A plus, maybe I'll call it alpha times uh, z. Uh, and then where is that a from? Well, that's uh, for a inside of a. And that's by this decomposition, this vector space decomposition of L. But now let's notice that if we apply x to v, that's the same thing as applying a to v plus alpha, and then z applied to v. But notice that a applied to v is the same thing as applying lambda to a, and then scalar multiplying to v. And then here we have this is alpha mu applied to v, or scalar multiplied to v, because of this, line, uh, this eigenvector eigenvalue relationship. But we can factor all the scalars out of the left-hand side, and we'll have lambda applied to a plus alpha mu v. And then, well, let's note here that this is simply a scalar. So there we have it. Well, what do we have? Well, v is, in fact, an eigenvector of x, which was an arbitrary element of L. So that completes the proof of this lemma. Now we're ready for the proof of Lie's theorem, which is pretty similar to the proof of Engel's theorem. So we'll maybe just sketch it or go through it quickly. Okay, so this will proceed by induction on the dimension of this underlying vector space. So let's first suppose that this statement holds for all vector spaces of dimension k and then that the dimension of v is k plus 1. So that's our induct the start of our induction step. So the base case is really trivial. As we've seen before, if you've got a one-dimensional vector space, there is essentially nothing to do. Okay, so now next up, let's find a v inside of v such that um, v is a eigenvector all x inside of L. So that was precisely what we were able to do from the last lemma. So in other words, what we have is that x applied to v is the same thing as lambda x applied to v for some lambda, which in this case is going to go from v down to the base field, which is the complex numbers. So in other words, lambda is in the dual space of v. So this right here, this lambda x is just a number. And so that's the eigenvector eigenvalue relationship. It's just that the eigenvalue is going to depend on the linear transformation that we're hitting this thing with. OK, so next up, let's consider the well diagram that we just considered before. And it's going to go like this. We have v moving across to v via x, but now x is arbitrary. So maybe like this holds for any linear transformation x inside of L, viewed as a linear transformation of v. And then we've got this projection map, which I'll call pi again, and it goes down to v c v. So that's that quotient vector space. We have the same thing over here. So this pi goes down here to v. Um, and then C, V. Great. And then from this, we can define X bar um, applied to, let's see. Actually, now that I look at this, I'm going to use a different name for this. Let's call this W. This is W. Then this is W. And so this is C, W. Great. And now x applied to the coset v plus c w will be equal to x applied to v plus c w. So it's going to be that coset right there. OK, and then from that, we're going to construct this space that I believe we constructed on the last proof of Engel's theorem. And I don't remember if I called that L hat or L tilde, but let's today call it L tilde. And this is going to be the set of all x bar where x um, is inside of L. So let's observe that this is going to be a Lie subalgebra of GL v mod CW. Great. 
And so checking that that's a Lie algebra or that these linear transformations now form, that's, there's nothing, nothing really to do for that. Checking that it is solvable maybe requires a little bit of a homework exercise to write down, but I'll let you guys do that if you need to. Okay, so now note that this vector space right here at the end is k-dimensional. So that means we can apply the induction hypothesis to create this basis, which I'll call B bar. And this basis will be like V1 plus CW all the way up to VK plus CW, such that if we represent X bar within B bar, it's upper triangular. Great. And that's just upper triangular, not strictly upper triangular like we had with Engel's theorem. Okay, but then from this, we're going to lift this to a basis of the entire vector space, you know, just like we did before, and I'll call that B, and it'll be W, V1, all the way up to VK, and then you can check that since X bar was upper triangular in the basis B bar, then since X and X bar are related via this equation right here, that means that X is upper triangular in this basis. And that's not just like some X that is special, that's an arbitrary X. And that's actually all X at the same time. Because right here, this statement, maybe I should be careful to point out, is for all X bar inside of our L tilde. But since this is holding simultaneously for all X bar inside of L tilde, that means this is holding simultaneously for all X in L. But that's exactly where we wanted to end up. Okay, good. Now I'll leave you with some homework exercises. So now for a couple of exercises. So first, let's consider the following matrix Lie algebra. So notice it's upper triangular matrices. On the diagonal, we have entries 0, A, and 2A. And then just above the diagonal, we have entries B and B. And then above that, we have an entry C. And here, A, B, and C come from Z3, so the integers modulo 3, which is also known as F3. So it's the field with three elements. So first up, show that L is indeed a solvable Lie algebra. And then after that, find X, Y, and L that do not share an eigenvector. But notice that that's going to be in contrast to the statement that we had uh, for uh, vector spaces over C, where if you had a solvable Lie algebra, then there was a common eigenvector for every element of the Lie algebra. And so it doesn't hold in this case where we're not over C. So that's, I th think, interesting. Next up, let's take L to be a Lie algebra over C and then show that L is solvable if and only if L prime is nilpotent, where that's the derived subalgebra, the commutator subalgebra. And so you can think about this a little bit in terms of matrices. Like if you've got an upper triangular matrix or two upper triangular matrices and you apply the commutator, the bracket, if you will, then you'll get a strictly upper triangular matrix. Now, perhaps the other direction is not as visible using the matrix analogy, but maybe it is. Maybe you could think about if you have an upper triangular matrix, then it can always be exhibited as the bracket of two uh, not strictly upper triangular matrices. Okay, so anyway, um, those are two exercises based off of what we saw today, and that's a good place to stop.